And thank you, Martha. And i um, so gr grateful to see so many of you here despite the parking debacle out there. You all get a gold star. So, you know, come see me afterwards and I'll pass them out. So, <laughs> good to see you all. Um, let us pray. God, we're so grateful for um, this time to be together. And we're so grateful um, to receive uh, something from your word and in our community and I pray that you open our ears and our hearts um, that we might leave here changed today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. One of the fabulous and frustrating things about small town life is that everyone knows who you are. So back in Holland, Michigan, which is where I lived before my family moved to Oakland, I literally could not go anywhere without being recognized. Restaurants, movie theaters, grocery stores, even retail store dressing rooms. One time my friend Marla saw me at a clothing store before I saw her, so when I went into the dressing room, she started throwing items from the lingerie department over the door at me. Um, she thought she was hilarious. Uh, I might also mention that my friend Marla is also a pastor. So anyway, uh, when you're a pastor, the fabulousness and the frustration of being recognized in small town life is even more amplified. When you're a pastor whom everyone knows, it frequently means that people desire to share with you and update you on how their lives are, regardless if you only have 15 minutes to pump gas and grab a gallon of milk. And even though it sometimes happened at inconvenient times, some of the most meaningful pastoral care I got to be a part of happened in the cereal aisle of the grocery store. And I wouldn't change it for the world, even if it means I would sometimes show up to dinner with my family a few minutes late. Well, not surprisingly, Moving to a larger urban area where I know no one has been a bit of an adjustment. On the one hand, running into Safeway and quickly grabbing a loaf of bread, where the only thing I say to another person is, no thank you, I brought my own bag, is so much more efficient. But never having meaningful connections in surprising places when that was my norm feels a little isolating and lonely. However, since we moved here, I have just known that eventually I would bump into someone I know and that when it happened, it would be God's little wink at me. God knows how seen and connected run-ins with familiar folks are to me, and I have just been waiting for that moment when it would show up. Well, on December 19, it happened. I was running errands and made a stop at the Chase Bank on Fruitvale Avenue. And as I was turning away from the teller, who did I see waiting in line behind me? Marjorie Colt. What a thrill it was to see not only a friendly face, but a face from church. And Marge has no idea what this meant to me. She did nothing extra on this particular day. She was just going about her business. But God used her presence as a way to offer me personal encouragement. Marge, just being Marge, communicated to me that God loves me, sees me, and is holding me. And isn't that just like God? To know our hearts that well, to love us in the really specific way we desire to be seen and loved. So I thought about this moment with Marge when I reflected on our scripture passage for today. The idea that being known by God, beheld by God, called beloved by God just for being you. When he shows up to be baptized on this day, Jesus has done nothing. 
There has yet been no water turned to wine, no feeding 5,000 people from the lunch of a small boy, no sermons yet where he preaches blessings to those called cursed and curses to those who confuse greed for blessings. On this particular day, he is Jesus from the block. The guy who roughhoused and was chased around by his older cousin John. The guy who swept up sawdust in his adoptive father's wood shop. The guy who his family watched and waited to see when Jesus would go from awkward teenager to the savior of the world. This Jesus shows up one day at the Jordan River. And I imagine that there's this big queue of people lined up at the banks waiting their turn Jesus just waiting along with everybody else in the middle of the line. And John is receiving each person as it's their turn, guiding them in repentance, lovingly and passionately dunking them in the water before looking them in the eye and declaring them forgiven. And then John looks at the next person in line and he sees Jesus. His cousin. The man, though, whom his mother Elizabeth had told him would one day liberate them all and make all things right. And just as John had leapt in his mother's womb upon being near Jesus, who was in the womb of Mary, John leaps at the startling realization of what Jesus is asking him to do. John is filled with feelings of unworthiness, knowing there is no way his imperfections and sinfulness qualify him to be the baptizer of the Son of God. But just as John confesses his unworthiness, Jesus leans in and says, trust me on this. This is about the work of God in this act, not any sort of personal righteousness you can muster up. And it's God's righteousness, not humans, that is centered in this very moment. The moment before Jesus has done anything to prove that he is the Savior of the world. This is the moment when an unworthy John the Baptist lowers Jesus into the water. This is the moment where those gathered on the riverbanks are those who are there because they all realize just how broken they are and how much they need God to make change. This is the moment when every person present, including Jesus, knows that their actions and behaviors are not what earns righteousness. And this moment, this moment right here, is the one where Creator, Holy Spirit, and Christ join for the most profound theophany recorded in Scripture, a spiritual singularity, if you will. The heavens split open, God descends upon Jesus in the form of a dove, and the voice of God rings forth, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. And every person who is standing there understands that there is not one little thing they have done to earn being loved by God and they witness Jesus being called beloved not because of what he has done but simply because of who he belongs to. Can you imagine what kind of game changer 
this must have been for John the Baptist and those being baptized? To show up filled with guilt and a running total of all the ways you have failed God, your community, and yourself, and then to understand for the very first time that being called beloved by God is something that happens not from living, but by belonging. And this is a God who is absolutely crazy about you. This is a God who has your picture saved as his cell phone wallpaper. <laughs> this is a God who in a million ways and through a million acts on any given day says, you know I love you, right? And friends, what might change if you knew, I mean really knew, that no matter who you are, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what limitations you have, no matter what shows up on your criminal background check, no matter what kind of grades you got in school, no matter what curses the church or well-meaning pastors have spoken to you in the past, no matter what you look like, no matter where you live, no matter if you are a back pew kind of person or a volunteer every week kind of person, no matter what your gender or sexuality is, no matter if you're single or married, and no matter how you fail again when you walk out those doors in a few minutes, what if you knew that neither life nor death nor angels, nor rulers, nor anything present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in creation is able to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What if you knew? What if you knew? that when you move towards a relationship with God, you too go from baptism to beloved. That your worth is not what you do, but to whom you belong to, to whom calls you beloved, even when others call you broken. What would you do if you knew this? Because friends, this is not just a lofty idea. This is truth. If we really accept our identity like it was tattooed on our hearts, our souls, our minds, and we know that God's love is enough it is enough for us to make an impact just by being ourselves. God's love being enough translates to us being enough because God's love is enough. It means God works not just with us and through our gifts and good efforts, but sometimes despite them. In God's love being enough that you going about your business Showing up at Chase Bank on December 19th is all it takes to communicate worthiness to another. God's love for you is enough. And when we know this, we can just start showing up. Show up to be a light to the world, not just do our best impression of what we think a light is, not go to four years in college and three years of grad school to major in understanding light so we, we might be learned enough and qualified enough to turn your light on. No, 
The light's already there. You just keep showing up. Like the people at the banks of the Jordan and John the Baptist. God is the light. And God has dunked you, sprinkled you, and immersed you in light. And you glow because you are loved. All you need to do is be prepared for God to use you in surprising ways when you show up at the chase banks of the world. And now don't get me wrong, beloved of God, being beloved of God is not always easy because baptism is a radical act. Belonging to God isn't just a get-out-of-jail card that you redeem when you mess up. It's about something called metanoia. And metanoia is the Greek word used to describe what is happening with John's baptism back in verse 11. When John baptizes people, it is not only a mikvah or a ritual bath that Jewish people engaged in to purify their spiritual and practical uncleanliness. This baptism is something deeper. This points to total transformation, a reorientation that sets one's life on a completely different path. Jesus receives a baptism that suggests a transformation, even a rite of passage. Jesus enters those waters and it ignites his ministry. And this is the same baptism we receive. It is an outward action that points to something happening inside us that we can't see or easily put words to, and that's why we call it a sacrament. And if you have been baptized, if you belong to God, watch out. God has ignited something in you, too. Right, Martha? Up here for the first time today? Yes, God has ignited something in you, too. And not only are we beloved just because we belong to God, not only does God work in our lives in surprising ways, we are like holy wind-up toys. We were all wound up, going in one direction, but God comes along, picks us up, and sets us in a new direction, and we take off. Friends, your priorities have been reordered, regardless if you've figured that out yet. Your desires are changing. You have new vision in the way you see yourself and others. And God is opening your eyes to see the exciting and radical ways that God is working in the world. I asked you earlier what you would do differently if you knew deep in your identity that you are beloved of God. Well, my hope for you all is that you experience new freedom to take new risks, to see yourself and your purpose in fresh light, to test out your new wings, to trust that God is shaping you to see the world differently so that you can love it in ways you couldn't before, to, to trust that God is good and has given you good and meaningful gifts just for you, and that this world needs you to use them, and that even if you feel limited, your showing up is enough to be the light and the love of one unsuspecting small-town lady who has moved to Oakland. Friends, you are beloved. So be loved. And be that love for others. Amen. Let us pray. God, how difficult it is sometimes to receive good gifts. Man, there are times where we feel like we have to feel worthy before um, we are worthy. And despite how many times your word tells us that you love us, we keep showing up on the banks of the river to try again. 
And so we create the space. We take a moment to listen to the small light that you've ignited in each of our hearts. And just right now, we take a moment to create space to think about that light, to honor it, to listen to your spirit. Would you reveal to us the ways that you're working, the ways that you see us, even when the ways that we see ourselves feel so distorted? So let us just take just a moment and receive that gentle, loving voice that shows us the specificity in the way that God loves us. Church, you are loved and you are free to radically love your neighbor as yourself and God. And at this time, we're going to